Radio Irish. Because there's a little bit of Ireland in all of us. We're delighted to be speaking to writer and published author Gina Sigiletto. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Gina? Uh, very close. It's Sigilito. <laughs> so. Oh, Sigilito. Yeah, right, right. And that's an Italian name, Gina, no? It is, yeah. My mom's family is originally from County Derry, so that explains the Irish connection, but my dad is Italian, so. Oh, your mom is from County Derry? Uh, her family is. Um, oh, my nice. great-grandfather was from County Derry and came over um, through New Jersey actually and then ended up in the Midwest and I grew up in Missouri and then moved here uh, to New York City to go to college. And when was that? When did your your uh, relatives come over to the United States? It was the late 1700s. There were actually landowners in uh, Derry City. My great-grandfather was Alexander McClintock and came over I think about 1790. The first time I visited Ireland I was lucky enough to find some of our documents uh, when I was in Belfast and I actually Actually found a, a letter that he had written when he was leaving Ireland, which was really, really cool. So. What was his name? Alexander McClintock was the last name. And was he famous or infamous for anything, Gina? Well, he was a landowner, and so that's the only way I really found um, his documents. So I guess that was very rare to be able to find uh, documentation like that, because, you know, a lot of a lot of um, people did not own land at that time, you know. I guess, you know, he was sort of well-known. Uh, in his day. He was Protestant, but otherwise we have very little documentation. I actually had to get the uh, the letter that I that I found, I had to get it sent to me when I came back to the state because it was such a rare document. So That's very fascinating. Well, Gina, of course, you're no stranger to Irish culture, I see, having studied Irish history, art, literature, and politics at New York University here in the United States, and also at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. And you're no stranger indeed to radio, having served as a guest host and producer on the radio program Radio Free Erin. And you've travelled extensively throughout Ireland, of course, Gina. Uh, may I ask you, before we get on to your new book, what's your favourite county in Ireland? Our listeners here on Radio Irish will kill me if I don't ask you. <laughs> well, it's tough because I love Dublin so much and I've been to Ireland five times now. Um, but the last time I was there, which was two years ago, I was lucky enough to travel uh, with my family, actually, from Dublin um, all the way over to Kerry. And I actually just fell in love with Kerry. I thought it was just amazing. And we were there four days, um, but it was just, I just thought it was lovely, you know. And, and even though there's a lot of tourism in Ireland now, which is great, um, I just love the fact that they kind of kept the really quaint, you know, sort of... Um, you know, um, edge to Killarney. We were staying in Killarney, and then we traveled around the Ring of Kerry. So it's hard for me to say which is my favorite, but I do love Dublin. So. Ah, so you missed the kingdom of Kerry, huh? Yeah, it was, uh, it was, pretty, it was pretty fabulous. And we, we also traveled through Cork, which is, which is beautiful, too, through Cork City. So. Oh, it's a lovely, a lovely part of Ireland. Now, what is it about Irish history, Gina, that has you obviously hooked on it over the years of your career to date? Well, I think because, you know, when I was in college, which was the early 90s, um, you know, as you know now, there are some really great Irish studies programs in, in the United States, but then there re really weren't, there were hardly any. I think Harvard maybe was the only Irish studies program, and it was more Celtic study, ancient Celtic studies. So when I got interested, I mean, through my mom, I was always interested in Irish history, and actually my dad was too. Um, and, you know, he sort of got me hooked on, um, Irish myths when I was a kid, and so when I came to New York and became involved in the Irish cultural scene here, I noticed that very few women were being uh, written into any of, you know, sort of the celebrations that were going on or, you know, just any of the sort of um, history here in New York, and I thought that can't be. There have to be women <laughs> that have been involved in this, and so that really kind of got me on a journey um, and a search to um, you know, to find out more about the women's roles. And then as, as I did that, I was being asked to, you know, give, a, give speeches or write articles about how women were involved in Irish history. And that really brought me on this journey to write this book. So it's been about 15 years of, of independent study, really. Live from New York City, RadioIrish.com.
Well, now, your new book is fascinating. It's titled Daughters of Maeve, right. and it recounts the lives and times of 50 Irish women who changed the world. And this is an in-depth look at some of Ireland's most prominent female figures over the centuries, including St. Bridget, a patroness of Ireland, Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen of Connacht. Uh, the ancient warrior Queen Maeve is in there too. So is the suffragette Clara Dillon Darrow, union leader Mother Jones, Jackie Kennedy, Sinead O'Connor, President Mary Robinson, actress Maureen O'Hara, the Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Irish revolutionary Maud Gahn. You have them all in this book, Gina, and umpteen other Irish women also. Gina, what inspired you to write this book and how did you come to choose the 50 women in it? Well, it's interesting. I had written a book uh, about four years ago called The Wisdom of the Celts and um, that really enabled me to write this book because it did, um, it got, you know, a lot of attention, got nice reviews and that, um, and it sold um, really, really well, especially for such an esoteric subject. And I, you know, when I, when I was doing my research, I was studying Queen Mae because she was such a huge part of uh, Irish myth and literature, and and you know the incredible freedoms that she was afforded, and and just that Irish women in general were afforded before St. Patrick came along. Um, it, you know, I think people don't realize that that women had incredible sexual freedom, and uh, they could own property, and they they were on the battlefield. I mean, they had real incredible freedoms, and then ironically. Uh, once um, you know St. Patrick came along, and then in, in the Middle Ages, that that all stopped. So um, that really kind of gave me the impetus to to write this book. And the reason I called it the Daughters of Maeve was that you know I, you know there's a lot of controversy, as you know, about whether Queen Maeve really existed or not. But my point of view is that it doesn't really matter because she was such an incredible figure and so fierce and so independent that her myths and her story gave birth to all the women that came after her. So it's pretty interesting when I started to um, choose the women, I mean, I had women in mind that I just knew had to be in there, like Bernadette Dublin or Rose Kennedy or women that are just so iconic that, that there's no way they couldn't be in there. But then I also wanted to choose women that people may never have heard of uh, or the people outside the tri-state area would know like uh, Mary Brosnahan Sullivan who is a is a huge figure in New York City I mean she's a champion of the homeless uh, just you know a real incredible woman but people outside the New York City area may not have heard of her um, so I actually got together with my editor when we were first conceiving this book and we got questions like you know were there 50 Irish women that changed the world which is you know <laughs> I mean it, you know kind of an incredible question because we had to narrow the list down i was just going to say there are probably more than 50 there must be thousands no oh yeah and i i wanted to you know to do kind of an, a note section and then i thought it would just get so unwieldy because really what we what i wanted to do was choose women of different eras and also who were you know the first in their field you know i wanted to pick women from literature which you have such a plethora of, of irish women writers and then um you know uh, women who are involved in the struggle for you know Irish independence, uh, union leaders. I just wanted to, you know, mute, you know, to, I, we have Sinead O'Connor. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of take from every facet, and I also wanted to show that I didn't want the, it just to be 50 different stories. I wanted there to be a narrative thread throughout it that showed how each woman, you know, each woman sort of influenced the next generation. And, and, and there is a narrative to it because, you know, no matter what these, these women all come from disparate backgrounds, but they have a lot in common. I mean, you know, sort of a dedication to social justice, um, you know, a, a human a dedication to human rights. So there's, there are many similarities in a way. Now, you mentioned their Queen Maeve, Gina. Uh, recently, of course, we've had another queen, a story about Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen, raised the roofs of Broadway here. For those who don't know much about Grace O'Malley, uh, Gina, what will your book Daughters of Maeve tell us about her? Well, it's, it is really interesting that, that her story was made into a, a Broadway musical. I just, I, I was so fascinated by that. But um, uh, Grace O'Malley was actually a, a, a pirate queen who lived in the 16th century. And what's really fascinating about her is that she sort of came out of a vacuum. I mean, not only was she the, the first woman pirate, but she was also one of the few women in the Middle Ages that really sort of came out of nowhere. Um, and she was actually influenced by her father. Her father was a pirate 
self-renowned pirate, and you know she was always told that she could never be a pirate because she was a woman and it just wasn't done. But he encouraged her, and um, like a lot of women in this book, she was encouraged by her father to to sort of break barriers. Um, but it said that she uh, led 200 men at one point, and um, you know uh, was just an absolutely fierce leader in every way. The other very interesting thing about her is she lived at a time when the, the British were beginning to take over Irish land in, in spades, and she was able to, she and her her clan uh, were able to ward off British rule in, in much of the land that they owned, uh, which is, is amazing at the time because uh, the British were in full force, as you know, in Ireland. Um, so it really, my my piece on her goes into her personal life as well as her, um, you know, her adventures on the high seas and her, she was the first woman to stand up to Queen Elizabeth um, because she had inherited land from her husband and it was being taken away from her and uh, she, you know, stood up to Queen Elizabeth and said, you know, I'm, this, this is my property, these are my rights. So she's really an incredible woman. Absolutely fascinating. Live from New York City, Radio Irish. Dot com. Another fascinating contemporary Irish woman, of course, is Sinead O'Connor, who seems to have calmed down a bit over the years, and she's <laughs> returned to her love of, of music and family, of course. Tell me something, Gina. What, what do you think has been Sinead's most defining moment as an artist? Well, you know, uh, she has always fascinated me because she kind of came on the scene when I was still in high school, and I just thought, who is this woman? I mean, incredible voice. I had I had bought uh, The Lion and the Cobra, which is her debut album I mean like the first few weeks it came out I was just so fascinated by her um, and she's had such a career as you know I mean she just sort of blazed up the charts um, in the late 80s and early 90s and of course you know with, with her covering the Prince song and you know winning a Grammy and, and just all you know getting having a number one song in the United States all these things were incredible and then the night of course, that infamous night that she was on Saturday Night Live and uh, tore up a picture of the Pope, and she never recovered from that. I mean, it's funny. We just saw her um, at the Beacon uh, in the fall. She gave an amazing performance, and it was sold out. The show was sold out at the Beacon, and she, her voice is still beautiful. I mean, she's just an ama amazing performer. So people are still fascinated by her, and I think her music still stands alone. You know, she has a new CD out, and um, but she's not, she's, I don't think she ever recovered from that moment, and uh, it's a shame, you know, because she's just a glorious singer, and she had, I mean, she was making points about the church that, um, you know, whether you agree with them or not, came out later. I mean, she, you know, she was making some, some points about child abuse and, and things going on in the church before people were really speaking out about it. Um, so she had that you know, that sort of courage to do that, and it backfired on her, you know, uh, especially the way that she presented it, you know, presented her argument. Um, so, I, you know, I'm glad to see she's still out making music, though, because actually when I had finished uh, my piece on her and as this book went to press, she had been in retirement. So I'm glad to see that she's still out there doing it, you know. Well, of course, Sinead is sometimes more famous, as you said, for having ripped up that uh, photograph of Pope John Paul II. Why do you think Sinead has been so misinterpreted, Gina, over the years by mostly, if I may say, the American public? What is it, do you think, about Sinead that sees so much controversy follow her? Yeah, it's interesting. I was actually talking to a friend of mine about it because he went with me um, to see her. And, you know, it was just interesting to see women in the audience. It was like young women you know, in college that were just sort of mesmerized by her. And, you know, I don't know what it is. Um, you know, she, she did explain why she did what she did. Um, but for some reason, I think because she's just so audacious and so outspoken, you know, a lot of people still aren't into that with women, you know. In, in a lot of ways, that's why they react to her. And unfortunately, after that incident, after her career kind of took a, a downward spiral, um, she kind of got, you know, some of her more outrageous um, sort of, I even want to call them antics or, or, or actions, um, you know, got more press than her music ever did. So that was the problem, I think. Live from New York City, RadioIrish.com.
We're speaking to published author Gina Sigilito here on Radio Irish and your new book, Daughters of Maeve, Gina, is a fascinating read, I must say, about the accomplishments of 50 extraordinary Irish women throughout history and right up to the present day. Uh, But with regards to these women's accomplishments, Gina, why do you think their accomplishments over the duration of the history have been so largely ignored in a kind of a way? Well, it's interesting. I wish, you know, I wish I knew why. And it's really interesting to me. I mean, I, when I was writing this book, I mean, I learned so much. And I had been studying Irish women for 15 years. And, I mean, just as an example, Mary Robinson, who uh, became president, the first female president of Ireland when I was still in college, um, you know, I just sort of knew her through that role. And as I, as, as later on, when I started to study her more, I realized what an incredible feminist she was. I mean, she, you know, she pushed through some of the most progressive le- legislation in Ireland. And I didn't know that, you know, and, and I was, uh, people I was, that I was speaking to about writing this book, very learned people about Ireland. I mean, just, you know, really into Irish history and culture. And they're like, yeah, why hasn't there been a book that's kind of all-encompassing about Irish women? And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's, you know, I mean, a certain amount of sexism, I guess, but just you really have to dig on some of these women um, to, to find out their histories. And, you know, I did a lot of research in Ireland also, and some of that research just never made it over um, here. And even Irish-American women, uh, I think that there are a lot of things that, that uh, people don't know about, um, you know, the women I have in my book, and there, some of them are very well-known women, like Jackie Kennedy. Um, but, you know, she's uh, she has Irish roots as well, the rival of her husband, and a lot of people don't know that either. You know, they know everything about Jackie Kennedy. They tell you, you know, a lot about her family or, or um, you know, her accomplishments, but they didn't know that part of her history. So, I, you know, it's interesting why they've been so left out, but I'm hoping this sort of uh, helps out a bit with that, you know. Well, absolutely. Now we have a, a reference point, and your book is described as an indispensable reference that will move, instruct, and empower readers to uh, reach for their dreams as they stand on the shoulders of great Irish women. Do you think, uh, Gina, that there are any great Irish women today? Like, for instance, would you call Mary Harney a great Irish woman? And if so, what makes her great? Um, I suppose so. I, you know, I, ha- I have to say, I, Mary Harney has not um, sort of made an impression on me as much as these other women have. And I don't know if that's because... Um, you know, Ireland, uh, the political situation has settled down. Um, I'm not really sure. I don't see, I ended with Sinead O'Connor uh, for a reason, because I, at, at this point, I'm, I'm looking for that next woman that I think is really a breakout woman. And I think, you know, Bernadette Devlin, who I, who I feature in the book also, uh, the civil rights um, activist, you know, once said that, that she believes some of the greatest Irish women came out of the struggle, you know, the struggle for Irish independence or the struggle for uh, the, the labor movement or the, um, you know, the feminist movement. So that in times of turmoil, these women really rise to the occasion. Now that, again, that things are, the economy in Ireland is strong, um, the situation in Northern Ireland has settled down quite a bit. Um, I don't know that, you know, where that next generation of women is going to come from. Um, but, you know, my point, too, is that there's still work to be done there. I mean, you know, the situation in Northern Ireland is, is much, much better, um, but there are still issues there, as you know. Um, you know, there are issues in, in the Republic of Ireland still um, regarding women. So I think that that next generation will come around and, and, uh, and rise to the occasion as well. So. Do you have a favourite, Gina? Who is your favourite amongst the 50 extraordinary Irish women in the book Daughters of Maeve, which you've written? Who is who's your favourite and why? Um, I'd actually say it's a toss-up between Sinead O'Connor and Jackie Kennedy, and that's quite a disparate uh, <laughs> pairing, but I actually have um, admired Jackie Kennedy my whole life, really. I mean, I, I sort of um, thought she was just a formidable, really graceful, incredible figure. And, you know, the fact that, I mean, I think a lot of people know her for her style or her, you know, sort of her figurehead role or or what they saw as her figurehead role, but she was a huge part of the Kennedy family and uh, really helped give rise to the um, myth of Camelot. And that whole myth was her idea, that whole sort of... um, 
you know, thing was 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 her concept. And um, then I'd say Sinead O'Connor because I just I'm a big music fan anyway. Um, but I think that what she's done for women in rock and roll has just been unbelievable. And even though she you know got a bad rap for a long time, uh, you know my, what I say in the book is that there would be no Lilith Fair without. Sinead O'Connor, they w- there wouldn't be this whole sort of, you know, new wave of female songwriters like Alanis Morissette or even Courtney Love. I mean, you just, you wouldn't have that because she really paved the way for women to be outspoken. Um, and she's still considered one of the top 30 women in rock and roll, despite everything that's happened to her. Um, and she just never gives up. And I just think that's great. You know, I mean, it was really, really cool to see her live because she's just been through so much. And She's just still out there doing it and, and uh, you know, making her music and not letting anyone keep her down, which is kind of great. So I'd say those are my two favorites, definitely. We're speaking to Gina Sigilito on her new book, Daughters of Maeve, and there's a whole new chapter, uh, Gina, also on each of your 50 Irish women who changed the world, including one for slain journalist Veronica Guerin. Uh, what was it about Veronica that made her extraordinary? Well, I'd say um, really what fascinated me about her is just that, you know, she was always seen as um, the sort of, you know, a cowboy journalist in a way, if you will, that, that she wasn't really respected by a lot of her fellow journalists, but that she um, really was, you know, one of the bravest journalists, I think, to date. Um, and, and for people who don't know Veronica Guerin, and there, there were actually two movies made about her life uh, very recently, one of them uh, starring Kate Blanchett. But um, she was really responsible for getting a lot of the drug laws enforced in Ireland. I mean, as you know, in the late, the late 80s and early 90s, heroin was just an enormous problem, especially in Dublin, um, with, with really young kids even. I mean, you'd see you know, 10-year-old kids doing heroin. It was just unbelievable what was going on in Ireland at the time. And nobody could convict these um, drug lords that were running um, the the heroin rings because of the libel laws. Um, and she turned that on its ear. And she was uh, unfortunately killed for it. I mean, she was dealing with some really, really rough guys, you know, <laughs> over there. And... Um, you know, they, she just, you know, ultimately was uh, assassinated, which is very, very rare for journalists over there. But she uh, was killed at a very, very young age. And, uh, but, you know, her legacy lives on because of what she did. She completely changed um, the way uh, drug pushers are prosecuted in Ireland. So she's an amazing woman. Now, do you think uh, we were speaking there about Veronica Guerin, who's also renowned for her very high standard of journalism? Do you think journalism these days, Gina, stands in as high a regard as Veronica would have wanted it to? No, not at all. And it's funny because I actually started out wanting to be a journalist. Um, when I was in college and sort of uh, went more the publishing route and, and the author route, but um, I don't, and that's what really, especially in the United States, and I hate to say it, but I just, you know, there's almost no objectivity anymore in journalism, and there's no fearlessness anymore, and and that's really, and I mean, I think the, the coverage of, of the Iraq war is a perfect example of that. Um, that, you know, the, 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 with all the embedding and, and things that are going on um, with American journalists, they're afraid to ask any hard questions anymore, you know, and you don't know whose side they're on, and they shouldn't be on any side. They should be objective, and they should be covering the news as as it is, and I don't see that happening. And I also don't see, um, you know, I mean, you have exceptional journalists still in the field, of course, but I just don't see that dedication um, that, you know, and, and also that, that, you know, you really need to get your facts straight. And if you don't, you know, really, really momentous, uh, catastrophic things can happen. Um, and I think she would have been, you know, really disappointed to see the turn that journalism has taken because, I mean, she gave up her life, you know, to to talk about the truth and to make sure the truth got out there. And that's a real shame, you know. Live from New York City, RadioIrish.com. On a lighter note, Gina, talk to me a little bit about Maureen O'Hara, who's also in your book, one of Ireland's great motion picture and stage stars. What sort of a woman uh, were we dealing with here in Maureen? 
Well, I think it's interesting because most people know Maureen from The Quiet Man. And, you know, it's beautiful, you know, exceptionally just gorgeous, red-headed woman, you know, really fiery. Um, but what, what they may not know is that she, you know, because of the, the trails that she blazed in Hollywood, I mean, you know, now today we have actresses commanding you know, huge figures for for, um, for their films. But then, you know, you didn't have that. And she was a huge part of that. I mean, every leading man wanted to work with her. Um, and, you know, at, I mean, at the age of, you know, 14, she was accepted into the Abbey Theater. I mean, that's one of the, you know, most, the most prestigious uh, theater in Ireland. And when she came here, she was in her teens still, did her first movie when she was 19, um, you know, and had a pretty tumultuous, uh, tumultuous personal life, um, you know, was married a few times to a few men that nobody <laughs> would want to be married to, I don't think, and, uh, <laughs> but still, through it all, was a consummate professional, and was also, I mean, a great businesswoman, was one of the first women, to, or the only woman, actually, to run a, com- a commercial airline over here, and, um, and, you know, really lauded for her commitment to film, and, um, now, as one of the, I think, the only Irish woman to get the Kennedy uh, uh, Lifetime Achievement Award also. So she's just, you know, I think it, uh, with a lot of these women, you just sort of see this glamorous film star and people don't really realize that she was, you know, an incredibly smart, incredibly gifted uh, woman that just, you know, took no prisoners, really, which is very, very cool. Well, that's a surprise to me now. I didn't know that Maureen O'Hara uh, ran a commercial airline. Yeah, Antilles Airboats. Uh, she was the president of Antilles Airboats. The wife of James Joyce, of course, uh, Gina, was Nora Barnacle Joyce, who mm-hmm. was 16 from the west of Ireland when she and Jimmy Joyce fell head over heels for each other. Nora Barnacle Joyce is said to have been a funny, sharp-witted woman who would read her husband's poetry with great pleasure, uh, a supportive wife, as you say in your new book. Tell me something about Nora Barnacle Joyce that we will learn in your book, Gina. She was obviously very in love with James, her husband, but what did she accomplish herself? Well, to me, what was amazing is that I mean, to me, there would be no James Joyce without her because all of her stories, especially The Dead, which is his most beautiful story and and his most renowned, I mean, that whole story uh, about Michael Fury is, is her story. I mean, that happened to her. And he put it into words and made it this incredible short story. But really all of her experiences were what shaped his literature. And I think people don't realize that. You know, they think... James Joyce made this, married this chambermaid, and you know what an odd pairing, and you know that that she wasn't smart, and that she wasn't um, she didn't read his, his work, and, and that's just not true. Um, and if you read their letters to each other, they're just you know they're amazing. I mean they're amazing love letters, but they're also you know her writing is is you know really quite great too. Um, so you know my I think my point. Um, in, in the book is that without her stories, you know, he, he would be a very different writer. And, you know, also the fact that she just traveled with him her entire life in places where they didn't speak English. Um, you know, he wasn't working sometimes. I mean, they had no money. They, you know, had two babies and, like, we're trying to, you know, she's trying to raise them and in Trieste and, and um, all, you know, all over Europe without um, really uh, sometimes any friends or any support. Um, so that, you know, that was sort of an incredible point too. Um, I mean, she stood by him and loved him and was a great, eventually a great wife. She was not married to him most of her life, but um, and but just the fact that, that her stories were what, you now she was really his muse. Now, you mentioned that she was a, a, a chambermaid. Getting to the modern day now, do you think that stay-at-home moms are missing out on something, Gina? Or were the women featured in your book extraordinary for reasons that stay-at-home moms could never be? In other words, is there some common factor or common trait or some sort of uh, uh, feature that separates these 50 daughters of Maeve from your average stay-at-home mom? Or indeed, you know, any, any modern woman for that reason? Well, I think it is possible. I mean, I think, you know, as, as the women's movement, particularly over here, has progressed, um, I think women, you know, sometimes lose opportunities as well. You know, I, don't, I think there's a lot to be said for raising children. And I, even Jackie Kennedy said, you know, if you don't raise your children well, you haven't, you know, you failed. And, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, many women in the book 
were equal partners to their husbands in many, many ways. They, I mean, some of them may have done had their power behind the scenes, but um, even if they were, um, you know, staying at home and not working outside the home, they still had equal contributions. So I really, you know, when people talk about feminism, I have a very different view of it than I think um, some people do. I, I would never, you know, I think that any woman's choice is a valid one. And I think, you know, being at home and, and raising a family is just as important as anything else. And so I think, um, you know, Rose Kennedy is a perfect example of that, you know. I mean, I mean raised an incredible um, you know, a group of children that would go on to, to uh, accomplish amazing things and, you know, and did it very well and was an equal partner to her husband. Um, so I think that that's maybe what the message of the book is also is that whatever your choice, if you do it well, then you're contributing and you're making a real difference, which is, is cool too. It's nice to know that we still have all those options available to us, you know. <laughs> Gina, you were also co-editor of the book Wisdom of the Celts, uh, as we mentioned earlier, which is also available from Citadel Press, as, That's right. mm-hmm. as well as this book, your new book, Daughters of Maeve. And, and uh, are you working on any new books for your readers? Perhaps uh, something like Sons of Satanta, 50, I- <laughs> 50 Irish Men Who Changed the World? Uh, yeah. well, what about the men? I'm break because huh? I've written uh, two books in four years, which is really... Uh, <laughs> Kind of, uh, kind of knocked me out, but I do, um, I do write uh, fiction as well uh, and short stories. So I'm working on actually the, what I'm working on now is a novel, um, mm. uh, sort of based on on my own experiences. And not sure what's going to happen with that, but I'm um, sort of working on that on the side. Well, tell um, me, tell me something about that now. Some of it's based on my childhood, um, growing up in Missouri. I'm, I'm not quite sure how it's all going to fall into place yet, but um, it, I'd actually um, taken a class with the Irish writer uh, Noel Foylan, who just died, as you know. Mm. I took a memoir writing class with her in, at NYU uh, when she was here in New York, and I started to write pieces for her about when I was a little kid growing up in Missouri, and she was just really encouraging me um, to turn it into something else. And it sort of started out as a screenplay, and then I, you know, I was just sort of toying with different ideas. Um, and now I'm sort of, sort of piecing it together uh, as a novel. But she really inspired me in, in a huge way. Uh, it's just, and I had actually talked to her right before I emailed her right before she died right after she got um, her diagnosis and um, um, it's a real tragedy that she um, left us so soon but she was a, a really kind of a great inspiration for what I'm working on now so it's so sad so sad indeed finally Gina one fascinating fact in your new book caught my attention although I must say that your new book Daughters of Maeve is chock-a-block with fascinating and often surprising facts about Irish women Uh, but one fascinating fact jumped right out of the page at me and that being the Irish origins of the jazz world's most gifted singer Billie Holiday yeah and we put her on the cover for a reason because you know, for for a few reasons. I mean, I thought that we we get people's attention, but also that you know people think that they have, um, you know, people may have a very narrow view about what they think it is to be an Irish woman. And my point is that you you know you don't have to look or or um, conform to a certain idea to be a great Irish woman. But um, yeah, Billie Holiday had um, Irish roots. She was the granddaughter of an Irish slave owner, uh, Charles. Fay. And um, when I, I mean, when I read that, because I'd read Lady Sings the Blues when I was in my teens, I was, you know, that really jumped out at me. Um, and, you know, and it was a big part of her life. I mean, she was Catholic, um, she, and she identified with being Irish. And, you know, to me, that's like, that makes her as important as anyone else, you know, who, and of course, I mean, she changed the face of music forever. She's one of my favorite singers of all time. And I just thought we have to have her in this book um, or else or else we're not doing our job here, you know. And, um, and so it, it, that really fascinates a lot of people. In fact, I'd given a few readings um, uh, last summer when this book came out and people were like, oh, tell us about Billie Holiday. And, and, and so that was really kind of great, you know. And also that's the re- one of the reasons we wanted to put her on the cover as well. Who would have known Billie Holiday with Irish Roots? And we want to thank very much author Gina Sigilito 
whose new book, Daughters of Maeve, 50 Irish Women Who Changed the World, is now on the stands. Thank you so much for talking to us here on Radio Irish today, Gina. Oh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Live from New York City, RadioIrish.com.